Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Francesco Del Carpio, and I'm the CFAL York Operations Coordinator. I would like to officially open the first session of our AI for Global Health Challenges and Lessons Learned Speaker Series with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge and recognize that many Indigenous nations have longstanding relationships with the territory upon which our campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. The area is known as Tecoronto and has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Metis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and the territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. As this is an online event, and our participants are joining from various locations, I strongly encourage you to learn about the traditional land upon which you are located. With this, I welcome our moderator, our speaker, and our participants from around the world. Welcome to the webinar. For those who may not be familiar with CFAL York, our center was established in 2020 and started its operations in 2021. CFAL York was created in collaboration between the United Nations Institute for Training and Research, UNITAR, and York University with York Region to develop and deliver training and knowledge sharing, as well as capacity building programs across five focus areas, which are disaster risk, emergency management and humanitarian actions, health development, environment and climate change, entrepreneurship, digital technology and economic development, equity, diversity and inclusion, and advancing the UN Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs. With more than 270 individuals registered for the speaker series, we are very glad to say that this series has been very well received by the academic and professional colleagues from around the world. Today's session is the first session of the eight planned for the series. I would like now to give I would like to now give the floor to Dr. Jude Kong for a brief introduction of the series and the Global South AI for Pandemic and Epidemic Preparedness and Response Network. Dr. Kong is an assistant professor in the Department of Mathematics and Statistics in the Faculty of Science at York University. Dr. Kong is also the executive director for both the Global South AI for Pandemic and Epidemic Preparedness and Response Network and the Africa Canada Artificial Intelligence and Data Innovation Consortium. Dr. Kong, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Francis. And okay, good. I hope you're able to see my screen. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, bonjour. You see Jude, you see the director of the AI for PEP, which is the Global South Artificial Intelligence for Pandemic and Epidemic Preparedness Response and Response Network. Um, to start with, let me just walk you through what we stand for, what our aim, what we plan to achieve, which will be the reason behind this lecture series that our partners are helping us to organize. We aim to deepen the understanding of how to use responsible AI solutions to improve public health preparedness and response to emerging and re-emerging infectious disease outbreaks. In order to achieve this, we aim to establish and support a multi-regional network across the global South to address gaps in knowledge, capacities, and solutions. These networks, working locally will inform national, regional, and global policies and practices on the use of artificial intelligence to improve health equity and strengthen public health system. You can think of this as creating a niche for the global south by the global south so that the global south could solve their problem by themselves. We solve our problem, we understand local realities, we work together to solve our issues. As a network, we are currently in the process of establishing nodes throughout the Global South. Um, we will be establishing four nodes in Africa, four nodes in the Middle East and North Africa, four nodes in South America and the Caribbean, four nodes in Asia. Uh, it, these are just the starting nodes. We'll expand with time. And our nodes are a network of collaborating research centers on digital one health across the global south. So this is what the notes will be doing. And they will ensure that AI for PEP can meet its objectives with locally relevant solutions. Very, very important. Um, our strategy, we are using an interdisciplinary approach. So breaking silos between discipline, grounded in an intersectional feminist and decolonial framework. Very vital that we decolonize research. And as you will see, as we work together, 
which I will be calling all of you here today to work with us throughout the whole process so that we decolonize research and do it from a different perspective. Some of you may have seen from the call that we have, the approach that we are using, very decolonial, so that we are forming this together. So our approach embraced democratization and the patriarchization of knowledge production, ensuring that we break silos between policymakers, researchers, and local communities. At this point, it's time for me now to thank our funders. This idea would not have come into fruition without the ideas that strongly believe in communities that are neglected by the central system. In a lot of my conversation with ideas, I always say the word, how somebody that would not otherwise find himself in this hospital benefit from this. They care about strengthening healthcare system in communities like the ones that some of us grew up in, that if the whole community was just to disappear, nobody will ever give a dime. And most of the solutions that exist are proactive as we know, or reactive as we know, and IDRC is that partner standing there, putting them and putting everything to ensure that we come up with proactive solutions. And we all know artificial intelligence is proven to that. So coming together, creating a niche for ourselves, supported by the IDRC, and that are working with us to ensure that we build a team of people that will use Digital One Health to solve issues that are locally relevant to them is very vital. So we want to thank them as well as York University still for supporting this financially and hosting us. Um, this is one in many lecture series that we will be having. This will run for a couple of months, every month. And we, the first one is Artificial Intelligence for Global Health, Challenges and Lessons Learned. Going from forward, we have a series of speakers from the Global South coming to share with us the lessons that you have learned, developing digital technology for healthcare system and working in your local environment. As we move from there, we'll move to another lecture series, but still it will be us talking to ourselves and trying to learn from each other, from the Global South. Very, very important. At this point, it's time now for me to thank our partner, Sifa York. And uh, the, the director of Sifa will be speaking after me. So I wouldn't say a lot about Sifa, but I want to tell Sifa that we really appreciate you taking the lead to organize this for us. I equally want to thank our other partners, IDEM, the Global Health Network, the Dallas Institute for Global Health Research at York University that have been with us throughout, together with Sifa, as well as Why Emerge at York University that have been with us since 2020, working with academic and now AI for PEP, ensuring that we have government and local communities to contain and manage the spread of emerging and re-emerging diseases. With this, I tell Sifa and the director who's present here, thank you so much for the support. Thank you for working with us. Thank you for ensuring that we achieve SDG3 and SDG5. Thanks so much. Um, I want to just introduce the faces that are behind AI for PEP to you. We have Professor Gertrude Miana, who's looking at the gender aspect. We have Professor Patricia Perkins. We have Professor Tara Penny. We have Professor Jen Hong Wu. We have Professor Amrita Dari, and we have Barista Jake Ofodu, who's looking at AI governance. We have Professor Ali Asgari, who is the director of CIFI York. We have Professor Alvin Bele. We have Professor Nathaniel Osgood. We have Professor James Obinski, who is a great advice to us. We have uh, Dr. Nicola Bregazi. We have Professor Sylvia Bauer, and we have Professor Marie Gotten. The team at York that you may have reached out to, I just may just pen out the faces to you that you'll be reaching out to as I will be making an appeal for you to reach out to them. We have Dr. Jean Jacques Rezouan, who is a network manager, and forming this network that will be forming. We have Dr. Nicola Bregazi, who is a chief scientist, and then we have Liswa Lulanga, who is the communication and community engagement person. You may have heard from them, but if not, please do reach out to them. They are willing to chat with you. Just have one on one meeting with them. We're trying to form this as a family. I call this a family because I believe that we will solve the global world problem as one if we come together as a family. And that's what AI for PEP stands for. That's what we are forming. Please do reach out to them. Work with us. We are calling you work with us. We are. This is one in many lecture series, but we are looking for you to reach out to us and say, I'm putting together a group of people in my country 
to organize a regional lecture series that's looking at pandemic and epidemic preparedness and looking at how digital one health can solve that. Can we work together? We will have funding for this locally if it's based in the global south. Please do put yourself together, organize this lecture series, work with us, be part of uh, our lecture series that CIFA York is organizing. Let's work as a community and get to address issues in our community. Work with us in community engagement. Tell us about your podcast that is driving digital health. Tell us about capacity building and how we can support that. I want to tell you that our funders, the IDRC, really wants that to empower us to ensure that we build local capacity. People in the global south that understand local realities, working with the communities, going to the community as tools, and in a very decolonial framework, solving the issues that the community is facing, ensuring that we don't have another Mabok virus spreading in Equatorial Guinea or, and moving across countries. Because it's only when we come together and share ideas and work together in a decolonial way that we'll solve our issue. Engaging with decision makers and working with us to see that whatever you produced is used by decision makers, we will be there for you. Uh, merci beaucoup. Thank you. I'm looking forward to us working together. Thank you very much for that introduction and all that information. <clears throat> um, and yes, of course, we're very happy to be working on you, or sorry, <laughs> working on this project and speaker series with you as well. Um, and so just without further ado, uh, I would like to uh, introduce Dr. Blessing Ogbu Okiri as our moderator. Dr. Blessing Ogbu Okiri is a postdoctoral fellow and instructor at York University. He has over 15 years of combined professional experience across a broad range of fields in academia, industry, and community-based organizations. He is a dynamic team player who is eager to utilize his diverse talents to advance research and innovation. Dr. Ogbu Okiri is interested in machine learning for health, data science for social good, social media computing, natural language processing, and theoretical computing. His goal is to actively collaborate with researchers in several interdisciplinary groups in using AI to help government and local communities to contain and manage the spread of community-based infectious disease outbreaks such as COVID-19, malaria, and Mpox. Dr. Ogbu Okiri, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much, Francesco, and uh, welcome everyone to our webinar series. Uh, this is the first of its kind, and it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Collins Odano, who's going to be our speaker for today. Before I introduce Dr. Collins Odano, I would like to bring this to our notice that uh, while Dr. Collins is uh, presenting his talk or giving his talk, if you have any question, you could actually put it on the, on the chat or you write it down, then we can actually read it for you or, or you send it to us directly. So you can send your question to the chat or you can uh, have a slot to ask your question after the presentation. Our first speaker today is Dr. Collins Odano. Dr. Collins Odano is uh, an associate professor of computer science uh, with specialty in artificial intelligence. He teaches in the Department of Computer Science, University of Nigeria and Soka. He holds a bachelor's degree in computer science and engineering, a master's degree in computer science, data communication specialist, and a PhD in electronics engineering, intelligence agent system specialist. He has advanced training and certification in cloud computing and network visualization, internet of things, data science, grant writing and online lecture delivery, ETC. He has skills in data, manage, data analyst, analyst and multi-agent learning system pedagogy. Collins Odano leads a university research group, the High Peak, the High Performance and Intelligent Computing Group, High Peak Lab, across disciplinary research group based in the Department of Computer Science. He has won several project grants funded by the Lacuna Fund 2020, NVIDIA Developer Program 2022, UNESCO HP 2020, 2009 to 2013, Google 2011 Nigerian Tertiary Education Trust Fund, Debt Fund 2016, 2020, 2021. He is also an Oracle Academy Faculty Prize winner in Artificial Intelligence 2029, 2019. His project, his, his project experiences include network visualization, cloud, grid, and edge computing. Professor 
Collins Odano leads the labor and productivity cluster of the volunteer expert group on the formulation of artificial intelligence policy for Nigeria. He has also been involved in several international projects, collaborations across Europe and Africa, some of which include the HP UNESCO Brain Gain Initiative, the AI for Africa project, EU Horizon 2020 project, the Work Crime Sign Grant, the EU Greek Forum, IT Study Group 13. In 2011, he led the team that developed the pigeon search engine for Google. Dr. Collins Odano has more than 30 peer-reviewed publications in international journals and, con and conference proceedings indexed and ranked by Cleveric Ana Analytics and Sp Springer and uh, Scopus. Please, let's make welcome Dr. Collins Odano. Over to you, sir. Good evening, everyone uh, in Nigeria is evening. Good afternoon if you are in Canada, morning, any other part of the world. Uh, it's my pleasure to be part of this uh, push making event. And I want to thank uh, the Global South Initiative. I want to thank Dr. Uh, Professor uh, Jude Kong and uh, his team. Thank you very much. I hope that we'll all enjoy today's uh, lecture as we begin in a few minutes time. So I'm going to share my screen as I take the talk for, for today, okay? All right, let me... Yeah, I hope you can all see my screen. Dr. Bokri, confirm you can see my screen. Yes, yes we, yes, can, we can, can see. Uh, it's not okay. in the uh, presentation, but please. It is, it is. In a presentation mode. It is currently. It is right now. Please confirm. Go, I'm no, seeing go down the bottom. Go down the bottom and click on this. This circle, this in here. Click on the, this projection here, the one down okay. on the right. Let me let me stop sharing and start again because I'm I'm seeing. Uh, I'm okay. Just a minute. All right. Can you see it in project projection mode, presentation mode? No, Can you no, see no. It? Not presentation. Go down, mode. Go down oh. at the bottom. You will see that at the bottom after this. Um, are you seeing the four icon at the bottom? Comment note. Okay, oh. some people are saying it shows in uh, it shows as a presentation mode on their own side. Yeah, yeah I'm seeing it as okay. presentation I mode. I here. think it's because we are panelists, maybe. So you can continue, sir. Yeah, it's it's in presentation mode here. Okay, that's okay. okay. All right. Okay, once again, good evening, everyone. I'll be speaking on responsible artificial intelligence healthcare applications for developing countries. And uh, I'm supported by two research groups. They, just like the moderator has rightly said, the High Performance and Intelligent Computing Lab, HIPIC. Uh, he has introduced us, went to uh, cloud computing, high performance and intelligent computing and uh, wireless sensor networks, as well as artificial intelligence and machine learning. I'm also supported by the CTIA, the Center for Translation and Implementation Research, which is made up of a team of uh, medical doctors and experts in the medical field. It says a research group, it's a center domiciled at the University of Nigeria Teaching Hospital in Enugu UNTH. We've been working together for some time now on a number of uh, uh, health-related uh, researches. For to, tonight, I will be looking at the following thing. I will want to identify developing countries, healthcare challenges in developing countries, 
the need for automation in healthcare, need for technology and innovation in the healthcare industry, how AI is used in the healthcare industry. We we'll also talk about responsible AI in the healthcare industry. What are the challenges of responsible AI in healthcare industry? And then we'll look at the user engagements and uh, we'll present uh, what uh, may look like uh, a proposed architecture for AI healthcare application. Then we'll conclude with recommendations. First of all, uh, I believe we know the region called the developing countries. In this map, we see that the regions depicted in orange, you look at this global map, the re regions depicted in orange uh, form the region called developing countries. They are mostly found in Africa, Asia, and um, some parts of uh, South America. And then if you look closely in the map also, you also see some red dots. Sorry, Those um, are the- Sorry, sorry Dr. Uh, Dr. Dano, it seems like uh, people are not seeing the map. I don't know, can you move the slide? If the slide, are you still on your first slide? Because that's what we see here. Yeah, I've moved the slide. Um, which, the which page are you seeing right now? Uh, for me, I'm only seeing the first uh, slide and the audience seems like they're seeing the first slide. It's okay, they also complain that uh, it's not moving. I don't know why um, it is not moving. Um, okay, do I, do I stop and reshare? Maybe you could do that or Francesco, do you think we should share the slide on our side for him while, while uh, yeah, if you want to email me the slides, I can I can quickly share them, and you can just let me know when you'd like me to move slides. Um, okay, so oh, now, it's after, now. Can, can you, you see it now? Perfect. Yes. Can you see so, it now? Yes, we're okay. seeing it. Maybe it's network okay. issue. Yes. Okay, so so the, the so back to the map. And, could you try to go to a new slide? Let's see if it's gonna move. Okay, it's moving, and go okay. back. Okay, cool. Okay. Okay, so like I was saying, the region shown in orange color form the developing countries of which you see Africa, Asia, and uh, South America. And then when you look at the map also, you see some red dots. These are countries um, uh, within the, the developing countries that are least developed. So the, the developing country can be defined by geographical location as we see in the map, as well as by economic indices also. And then uh, they're also known to not be able to uh, produce uh, sufficiently for themselves. And the uh, majority of the people there live in poverty. And uh, the, incidentally, this region constitutes of 70% of over 70% of the 7 billion of the world population, with many living, uh, having a GDP of between $1,000 and $4,000. Then uh, we look at the challenges, uh, the healthcare challenges in these developing countries. We discover that more than 60% of uh, Africa, the continent itself, uh, reside in the rural areas. And uh, over 80% of these people find it difficult to assess uh, modern healthcare. They will also see that about half of the population of the citizens in Africa uh, cannot get access or gain access to, to the healthcare they need. And we, with this, we, we also see that um, no part of the world has been deprived of uh, health care as countries in this region. One of the challenges we also find facing health care in developing countries is, is the limited doctors and migration of medical personnel. If you look at this, this graph here, uh, shown, uh, by, developed by the World Health Organization, here it shows African countries with uh, the number of uh, doctors they have. 
it only showed the ones, the countries with the highest number of doctors. If you look at, if you can see, Nigeria ranks first with about 74,543 medical doctors, followed by Algeria, South Africa, DR Congo, Ethiopia, in that order. Then when you look at the, uh, this same region, Africa, we're taking Africa as a case study, you discover that uh, the, the population of Africa has been growing steadily at the rate of 2.5% uh, uh, annually for the past two decades. And the uh, World Health Organization forecasts that by 2050, Africa will reach a population of 2.4 billion. And, uh, with, and this population will, only be, will be served by only 2% of the total doctors in the entire world. And then when we look at the, the doctor to patient ratio, if you look at uh, this, you will see that Nigeria has a one is to 2,800. That's one doctor to 2,800 patients. Algeria one is to 606. South Africa one is to 1,315. And in that order, when you look at the, the, the pie chart here, you see that for instance, Nigeria has 16%. It means that about 16, only about 16% of the population uh, can be attended to by medical doctors. And it continues in that order in Algeria, 4%, South Africa, 8%, and so forth. And then a major challenge facing healthcare in Nigeria and some other parts of Africa and the developing parts of the world is the migration of doctors, which is called, which is a, a new brain drain. A lot of doctors are leaving the continent to places where they, they, they have, they hope to uh, enjoy greener pasture. Uh, I, during my study, I discovered that Nigeria produces, graduates between 3,000 to 3,500 3, medical doctors every year from our higher institutions. And uh, uh, the Nigerian Medical Association, NMA, uh, from their report said that every week, 50 medical doctors, we're talking about doctors alone, we're not including nurses and other health uh, uh, care professionals, but doctors alone. Every week, 50 medical doctors leave the shores of Nigeria. If you do the maths, it will give you about 2,600 medical doctors leaving the country every year. So if you subtract this from 3,000, or let's use the upper limit of 3,500, you see how many, maybe about 900 doctors remaining after the exit of these doctors. And then if you, if you refer to the initial graph I showed you, uh, where Nigeria ranked highest in, the, in terms of number of medical doctors with about uh, 74,000 and there above, uh, the NMA also has it that, uh, Nigeria has 80,000 registered medical doctors, out of which only 40,000 of them practice in Nigeria. So this migration uh, has left a serious deficit, making the country uh, needing over 33,000 or thereabout medical doctors. And then be, beside the, uh, the brain drain, we also have an, uh, a region, an urban migration which has left over 10,000 primary, primary care health centers without doctors in most villages and rural, 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 rural places. Then we, we, with this, we see that there's need for automation. There's a need for automation in healthcare because uh, with the trend of things, we may not uh, be able to predict that it will get better. But what do we do in the face of the circumstance? So if you look at this, we will see that we, what we need to do is to begin to think of automation, automating the, the services that the doctors provide. And uh, if you look at the, the pictures by the left side of the screen, you see a typical example. You get to a hospital in a rural area and you see hundreds of people seated or sitting outside 
waiting to see one doctor, perhaps the only one who is available in that place. So uh, some of the challenges uh, that face our current healthcare system include high medical expenses. Of course, you know that in most of uh, these uh, developing countries, many of the citizens do not have health insurance. And so uh, some of them, many of them go to hospital as a last resort. And uh, it's many at times it is when the case has become uh, very late as a matter of can't help. Then we also have the issue of insufficient distribution of medical resources and um, uneven distribution of medical resources along uh, rural and uh, regional. You discover that the best hospitals are usually in the big cities. But when you come to the rural areas, you hardly find any functional one. We also discover that lack of information sharing is another limitation that hinders our present healthcare system. And then lack of uh, continuous monitoring and management of the health indicators. So, um, so what do we do in the face of this? We are looking at the need for technology and automation in the healthcare industry. In developing countries, um, the use of mobile phone has become uh, very common that places where hospitals could not get to, places where doctors could not get to, mobile phones get there. And so it is uh, right for us to begin to think of what to do with this uh, technology that has come to be with us. And these technologies are able to assess the remote and interior places. So we begin to think in terms of developing healthcare applications that are mobile based, that can be ported to mobile application, mobile phones, which the, which the people in the rural communities have access to. So we, we discover that mobile, with the help of mobile phone, it will help us to reduce this problem, this challenge of healthcare we're having in developing countries. If you look at the image by the left, you will see uh, set uh, three women in a, a rural India making use of uh, a device to check the vital organs such as a uh, heartbeat. There's a mobile phone, uh, maybe you will not be able to see it, that, that this is connected to. And with that, the uh, information is transmitted to a server where a doctor somewhere monitors it and knows when to invite such one to the hospital or to schedule a visit. So this, uh, this has become very important. So there's need to innovate the service model, the, the old service model, and to introduce all weather long-term deep level health services for healthy and health, for healthy and sick, uh, sorry, yes, for, for all around health, sorry, all right. So how do we use AI in healthcare? How do we use AI in healthcare? AI has become a buzzword and uh, we've seen it being applied in different areas. Why not healthcare? Today we can use artificial intelligence and it's a uh, sub, technologies like machine learning, robotics, deep learning, and the rest of it to uh, manage our healthcare systems and to monitor our health. For instance, we can use it in, in diagnosis of disease, image processing, um, operation, drug discovery, personalized medicine, and the rest of it. Sometimes we can also use it as wearable devices like the ECG to monitor our vitals and transmit them to the cloud in real time. And this, the use of AI in uh, healthcare is said to reduce health cost, the healthcare cost to between 20 to 30%. So it's cost saving. 
Then uh, another issue that is pertinent is the issue of responsible AI. Responsible Okay, um, seems like we lost him. Okay, um, Francesco, please, could you, could you confirm if uh, you are hearing him from your side? Uh, no, I'm not hearing him either. I think uh, his connection froze. Okay. So, I do still see him connected to the call though, so it might just be a, like a network issue. Sorry, could you tell that again? Oh, I still see him connected. To, oh no, there we go. He was he was still on the call, but he just dropped out. I think it's uh, I think it's probably just his internet. Okay, so um, all right. Thank you very much. Um, while um, we are waiting for his recognition, uh, everyone, you can send your questions to the uh, Q and A session. And um, make sure that uh, you you make it brief so that during the QA section we will be able to read it for him to give us feedback. I see that uh, some people have actually sent their questions. Okay, let me. Okay, thank you. It's, it's... Okay, Professor, we lost you. I don't know. Could could you put your microphone on, please? Sorry, network went All right. off. All right. All right. So uh, I hope you can still see my screen. Not at all. Can you still see my screen? Oops. OK, let, let, me, let me share it again. Oh, sorry about that. Um, Can you see it now? Yes, we can see your screen. I can see your screen, okay. yes. You can? Yes, go ahead. You can, all right. So I was, uh, I don't know where you heard me yes, last. Yes, this, was... this is where you were okay. talking about the responsible AI. Okay. Thank you very okay. much. All right, thank you. So when we talk about responsible AI, we are talking about, we look at it in, ethic, in terms of ethics, in terms of being legal. So in the context of uh, uh, healthcare, responsible AI is concerned with implementing uh, AI systems that are ethical, transparent, and accountable. We ensure that the technologies we use meet the ethics for the development of such systems, especially when we talk about healthcare, the healthcare industry has a lot of uh, ethics to comply with. And then we must ensure that our AI systems must be responsible. They must be ethical. They must be transparent. They must be accountable. Somebody must be able to give account for how a system works for the output it produces. Because one of the things we are going to find out is that times you're going to see that uh, results may be inconclusive, results may show false positive or false negative, which may be detrimental to someone's health. So we also need to promote fairness and equality, as well as in, that the system must be inter interpretable and explainable. Um, the discussion the, in, in AI, responsible AI, uh, gained momentum around 2009 when uh, the topic then was on ethics in healthcare. So the interest was on developing, making sure that AI systems in healthcare meet uh, with ethical considerations that are ne necessary in the medical industry. Then in 20, 2012, a new term came up, which is uh, at factual morality. I, that it is not just about developing 
uh, machine learning or deep learning that does the uh, anal analytic. But even when we develop uh, robots for operation and some other uh, processes in the healthcare industry, we, we must also take responsibility in it also. And then between 2014 and 2015, the, uh, the focus was on legal issues, privacy, and their uh, uh, ethical implications in medical research. And then in 2017, the discussion moved to uh, ethical designs of Internet of Things uh, devices. Today, we do not just talk about Internet of Things, we also talk about Internet of Medical Things. So, uh, because one of the things you find out, I may say this, I'll say this at this point, one of the things you find out uh, about uh, AI system development and responsible AI is that there are no strong regulations across many countries on this issue. Uh, being a part of the, the volunteer team that is working on developing the artificial intelligence policy for Nigeria has exposed me to this, that uh, many countries are at the point of developing AI policies. Uh, some of these things are new. So with the, the ethical consideration, regulations, legal issues have to be put in place, legal frameworks have to be put in place. And then between 2018 and 2020, the focus uh, was on the issue of black, board, black box medicine. One of the things you find in AI is that systems are encapsulated, that uh, you do not get much information on how it works. So the um, so issue of uh, privacy and data breaches may arise. So, so this needs to be considered. And then more other issue, uh, issues in uh, AI, responsible AI include uh, human-centered machine learning compliance, uh, secure AI, interpretable machine learning, and so on. So um, now look at, from uh, the works of uh, Mistel et al. We, they, he, he came up with six concerns on ethical uh, AI in healthcare, and uh, which he divided into three groups. The first he called the epistemic concerns, which, is, which has to do with quality of evidence. In that, one of them is inconclusive evidence that conclusions provided by AI-based and AI system based on data analysis with inferential statistic or machine learning techniques. For instance, uh, we may need to ask questions like, how does AI inform medical personnel during decision making? How to combine correlation relationships identified by AI with causation relationships? Uh, what type of task are appropriate for identifying causal relationship. Some of these are the some of the issues that uh, this talks about. There, what the, the effect is that the result produce uh, probabilities, but also uncertain knowledge. It also produce it produces uncertain knowledge. Another issue that uh, that has to do with uh, quality of evidence is uh, inscrutable evidence which is lack of transparency regarding the data used and the lack of interpretability of how each of the many data points used by machine, the machine learning algorithm contribute to the conclusion it generates. So we have said that transparency is one of the challenges, one of the things that responsible AI should be able to, uh, to handle. And uh, the effect is the blackboard issue that we, may, we mentioned just a few minutes ago. And then another uh, issue that of uh, concern, of uh, optimistic concern is misguided evidence. Algorithms are subject to a limitation shared by the type of data they used. So you discover if you are familiar with machine learning, you discover that different algorithms have different type of data sets that they support. So this can also bring a limitation to the 
performance of the system. So the effect here is that the evidence produced is observer dependent, which can also lead to bias. Bias is one of the issues, a very serious issue in a responsible AI, because uh, the, the system must uh, have, an, have an integrity that what it delivers for a, for a you should be able to deliver similarly for b given the same circumstance then the second uh, aspect of it is the normative concerns which has to do with fairness of action and it is its effects then uh, unfair outcomes is another is one of the the, the, the concerns here that actions are based on conclusive credible uh, with funded evidence, but it has disproportionate impact on one group. So it means that uh, the, the issue of bias is, it, it, this is close to the issue of bias, that while the system uh, may discriminate some people group, it may accept some other people group. Sometimes like the issue of uh, uh, facial identification and things like that, which has been an issue some time ago. So it can lead to discrimination. And then the next one is transformative effects. Yeah, algorithms, the algorithmic activities that uh, reontologize the working understanding and the conceptualize, conceptualizing it in new unexpected way may this can lead to challenges for autonomy, challenges for autonomy. Then the, the last aspect has is a combination of both, which is uh, both epi the epistemic and the normative. So talks about uh, traceability, problems emerged from five, the five uh, concerns that we have looked at before, okay? So the effect of this is that it can lead to issues with informational privacy and moral responsibility. So some of, these are some of the ethical challenges that we have found in uh, the issue of uh, AI privacy, AI, sorry, responsible AI. Then we talk about patients' engagement in responsible AI. Uh, of course, we know that when we talk of the healthcare, the patient is the target. So the patients must be engaged uh, for them to be able to use whatever system we develop. A survey was conducted in Spain uh, where about 150 pregnant women were sampled and uh, the questionnaire was distributed to them to see if they would be willing to be part of an experiment that uses uh, AI to monitor their vitals. And uh, the following conclusion or discovery were found that they observed that if they will trust the system, the system must be responsible, trustworthy, it must be useful, and it must be safe. So uh, we need to get the buy-in of the, the patients or the uh, potential patients before we can uh, fully engage them in the use of the system. Then another issue is cognitive engagement, which is connected to what pat the patient knows, what he understands. It is said that when the patient understands the purpose of the, the technology, what is being monitored, how it is being monitored, the patient will be more uh, uh, willing to cooperate with the use of that technology. And we find out that the benefits and the value the patients perceive concerning any given technology is what will influence its cognitive engagement. Then uh, I did a review of some of the top uh, AI healthcare applications. Um, at, there were over about, about 30 of them were reviewed, but I zeroed it down to about five of them that I found that uh, uh, are appealing 
And uh, I also looked into them to see their data policies as well as their um, responsible AI policy. So uh, here I present some of them, uh, not marketing any of them, neither am I the marketing any of them. Uh, these things are online. You can check them yourself. So the first one is Sensely. Sensely is uh, an empathy-driven uh, conversational platform. It uses an intelligent uh, uh, agent called Molly. And uh, Molly will discuss with you, will have a conversation with you about your health, ask you questions. And uh, based on your responses, she, the AI will recommend what you need to do. If it's an exercise, you need to take a walk, if you need to see a doctor, and all that. Um, and I checked, I did not see any information on data protection, neither did I see any information on responsible AI. The next one is Bina. Bina um, uses uh, the smartphone camera to track the health and, fit and fitness of uh, the patient. And uh, this, uh, this system said they, with the, the, the camera, they can conduct a bloodless blood test. That means they can perform, you can check your blood, how your blood, uh, your, your quantity of your blood and all the necessary blood tests, the hemoglobin and all that without extracting your blood. You will check it up. I also checked the data statement. Uh, it says that the data collection does not it does not store personal data nor the vital signs used. So, but on the issue of a responsible AI, I did not see any information. Then we move to the next one, Ada, which is a, a German based uh, uh, AI for health. It asks you questions to gain some knowledge about your health and extract data from uh, its digital a memory or database to knowledge base to compare with the, the symptoms it's receiving from you. Then on the issue of data information, data protection information, I, they, they, they have this to say, it says uh, protecting your data privacy under the act. So there's a statement on data uh, protection, which is vital. Why I'm looking at this is because when we talk about issue of privacy, responsible AI, data is important. Data is important because uh, many a times, uh, patients, when they, they come to the hospital, they usually come at their most vulnerable period. And uh, many of the healthcare professionals who are taking care of them uh, have their information. And this information may be released with uh, uh, without uh, authorization to people who ought not to have them. So that's why I'm looking at the issue of uh, data protection, because if we are going to develop an uh, AI system or AI app for healthcare, we need to also consider the issue of uh, privacy. So on responsible AI, I did not find any information for the other software. Then the next one is health tab. The health tab utilizes big data to create algorithms from which a patient responds to questions. It also manages a lab result and prescribes medicine. On data collection, uh, it, uh, okay. I think this is a mix up with the other one. So, but on responsible AI, there was no information. Then, uh, on the next one, I think the last one is uh, symptom, symptom mates, which keeps track of your symptoms and then uses the uh, inference, inference engine to, uh, pro to predict what disease based on the, uh, the, the symptoms it receives using natural language, uh, on the, uh, natural language processing. On data protection, it uses a state, stateless uh, API such that it does not store patients' data. And then on responsible AI, there were no information. So having seen this, 
And if we are looking at developing AI systems that will support our healthcare system, especially for people in developing countries where we have found that over between 60 to 80% of them live in the rural areas. We need to look at the demography of where they live and uh, the possibility of assessing them. Some of them are nomadic in nature. They are moved from one place to the other. Majority of them live uh, kilometers away from the city where you may not even have uh, access to the basic uh, necessities. So these are some of the things, the challenges they face. Many of them do not have access road, no access to electricity, communication towers, hospitals. And if the hospitals are there, they may be without doctors or without drugs. Some of them do not have access to portable water. Some of them are poor. And then uh, the only thing they have going for them is the air and nature around them. So how do we develop a system or systems that will suit the needs of this target audience if we have these people at the back of our mind? So here we uh, have a conceptual design of uh, the AI healthcare network infrastructure. If we are going to get to them, if we must reach them through a AI, we must consider uh, reinventing or changing the model with which some of the system, all the systems I've looked at uh, used. If you, dis if you look at it, you discover that all those systems are not meant for those in developing countries, except those who dwell in cities. So if you want to target those who uh, dwelling in rural areas, you need to think of uh, how they can get access to networks. Some of them may not have communication tower near them. So we need to think about uh, mobile devices that use satellite communication in case there is no uh, GSM network nearby. So I recommend the following, that uh, such application, such healthcare application must meet the following expectations. They must be able to run on mobile devices, mobile phones or devices like IoT or IOMT, Internet for Medical Things. And they must be able to support low memory, low uh, latency, and of course, low power consumption. That's for the hardware. Then they should be able to run on satellite communication in addition to GSM. And they must be conversational, must support natural language processing because majority of them only speak in their native dialect. So we must have system that is able to uh, discuss or the users must be able to talk to in their own language and be able, the system should be able to respond correctly. And then also uh, the, this, this systems must be able to interface between the patient and the doctor who may not be close by and get information or instructions in real time. And then finally, they must be able to obey the responsible AI paradigm and provide detailed documentation. So like the reviews I've done, I did not see any of the systems that has information on responsible AI. Recommendations. First of all, decision makers should draw upon the expertise of the communities to identify uh, the particular the priority. What's the what's the priority? What's the health priority? The community, each community uh, needs. What is its priority? The community must uh, identify what those things are, and then then build capacity for the recruitment and training of uh, healthcare workers in the underserved communities. Uh, in, in those areas, some of them are in desert, some of them are in riverine areas, areas that are difficult to assess. So governments and, uh, health and uh, decision makers should be able to provide incentives that will make uh, health professionals 
to want to serve in those areas. Because what we find common is that some of these people only have access to, uh, to healthcare, maybe once in a year when uh, WHO is celebrating World Day, the World Health Day of one baby for cancer. And then you have doctors come from town to give a free test, free eye test and all that. And at the end of that, that's, that's, that is it until the next year. Also, we recommend that uh, the computer and data scientists, clinical entrepreneurs, they should work together to develop this critical healthcare uh, issue, uh, the healthcare sector in using artificial intelligence, especially using machine learning. Then at the same time, um, the, the usage of digital health technology is rising and uh, it is, it, it is something that we must make provision for. Whether we are funders or researchers, they are, they, it is expanding and we have to provide for it to increase our research in that direction and harness it properly. Because governments have a role, governments have rules to play in this. The issue of uh, legislation, the issue of support for training, for training of uh, uh, citizens in the area of AI and machine learning research, they should be willing to provide funding and the rest of it to encourage the development of this technology that has come to stay. Finally, we look at the SDG, SDG3 goal, the Sustainable Development Goal 3 which is targeted at good health and well-being. And it is aimed at to ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages, prevent needless suffering from preventable diseases and premature death. And the goal is that by 2030, it should reduce global maternal mortality, the ratio, to less than 70 per 1,000 beds. Then the question I ask as we conclude is, how, how close are we to realizing this goal? With the scenario, with the picture I have painted so far, how far do you think we are to realizing this SDG3 goal? Then I conclude that AI is here to stay and with more research funding, we can get closer to this goal and we can get quicker to it than our conventional health system is able to offer. Thank you for your attention. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Dano, for a very thought provoking uh talk this is very interesting i really gained a lot it is it is quite interesting to note that you know responsible ai involves the practice development and deployment of ai with good intentions and it's also very interesting to actually you know understand how this will actually work in an african context in our own indigenous kind of data um before i go through the question and answers I would like to ask my question first, you know, maybe for clarity, and it is also very interesting. Um, interesting, actually, to to know what will happen in the case of, you know, um, who handles the how do we handle the issue of bias in our data, especially in the in the African context, because most of the responsible AI, so to say, that have been built is is driven by the. Western kind of data. It's not indigenous data or indigenous data sets that are being used. So how do we address the issue of bias in an African context? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, when we, in the process of developing, uh, formulating the AI policy for Nigeria, uh, this was one of the issues that, that came up. And uh, we proposed that AI systems uh, based on what, what we did, let me use that. We, 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 we looked at our legal framework in the country 
uh, for instance, I worked in the area of uh, employment and uh, there are issues of discrimination that may arise in the place of employment based on uh, somebody's uh, health status, based on somebody's gender, based on somebody's uh, 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 the whom, where it's coming from, maybe uh, parts of the country where it's coming from. And then we know that these things can lead to bias in the, in, in the system. Where Okay, uh, okay, um, it seems, I think um, we lost him again. Sorry, I think so. there are little technical hitches. We, uh, we hope that he's gonna connect as soon as possible. So, but while we wait for him, uh, we're going to read through the questions. I have like six uh, questions here. And I um, also have two persons that have raised their hands. So I'm going to be taking the questions one after the other. Okay. Okay, so we have um, Olua, Olua Pelumi Akom, Akomolafe. Okay, we have him Sorry, again. we lost him. I'm back. Okay, yeah. okay so, so as I was, I don't know, my modem keeps tripping off. But okay. It's okay. That's okay. I've changed the source. I've changed the source. It's okay. So uh, like I was saying, I was talking about what we are doing in Nigeria with the AI policy. So in addition to formulating the policy, there must be the licensed bodies who will be in charge of testing any system, any AI system to see that it complies with responsible AI uh, requirements before that system can be uh, licensed for use. So that's one, one of the, the second way of dealing with the issue of uh, bias. There must be a regulatory body that test this system across different domains, across different, uh, uh, using different uh, data, data samples. I think that will be able to check the issue of uh, bias. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Odano. And um, I would like to read the questions from our audience and um, we can take it up from there. So, Olwa uh, Pelumi Akomafe said, how okay, he has two questions. How cost effective will be will it be to build the app necessary for possibly responsible AI? I guess that's what he's asking. Then how very how very effective will will we be able to penetrate the rural areas in Nigeria? So I think that goes in line with the second person's question, which I'm going to read now so that yeah. you can uh -huh. which is Uchungwa Umbo said. Uh, most people do not use smartphones in Africa, and network is also an issue, especially in the rural areas. How will these health apps reach these people? So I think it goes in line with um, Oluwapelumi's uh, second question. So what's your yes. take on that? Yeah, thank you very much. That is why if you look at my, my proposed uh, conceptual architecture, you discover that uh, provision was made for that because we know that even if they are to use a smartphone, it's going to be an overload. It's going to add a, a latency issue, contribute to latency issue, even if they can have the network that will support it. And that's why uh, if you look at the, the, the architecture, we, what I'm looking at is, uh, I'll put it up again on the screen. We are looking at feature phones, not smartphones. And that is why it must be conversational, such that the, uh, the minimum they need is to do data, text, and voice. So that way, they, it, it will be able to work wherever 
they are in the remote places. And uh, coming to the first question, how cost effective it will be. Uh, this is, it, I think that uh, this is not something that will be left to the rural dwellers. Here, there's need for funders to come in. There's need for the government to come in to support in the development of these applications. So it should not just be left alone to the private uh, enterprises. Government and funders should come in here because this is solving a problem for them, the problem of uh, uh, lack of doctors. So, so the cost here is not entirely on the, the users, unlike what you see in some of the applications that I have uh, reviewed, that these are for, those ones are for elites, but we are looking at people who can barely read or write. That's why I said it must be conversational and uh, it must be of low latency so that the issue of, uh, so that you wouldn't need a smartphone. Any small phone can do that work. All right. So, and uh, like uh, the second question of Akomal Affair is talking about how very effective will it be to penetrate the rural areas? A good number of rural areas have a communication network, but uh, network is poor in most of those places. Many areas are not covered. And that is why I'm proposing making use of uh, satellite communication. Uh, satellite is going to be a very satellite communication for GSM will soon be common with um, the launch of uh, uh, what's this, um, this uh, forgotten the name. Satellite? Yeah, no, no, I'm talking of, uh, what's this guy, Elon Musk. Uh, okay. uh, yeah, satellite uh, that has come over, come to Nigeria and some other places. So I, I think that what is important is for us to know uh, what we want, the direction we want to go, how we want to solve a problem. And then the, the technology is already available. And then all we need to do is to get the buy-in of uh, uh, government and funders to support the, the work. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, uh, Professor Odano, for your question. Another question here from Justice Evans. Okay, from Nigeria, he says, what is the hazard of AI making wrong conclusions in human health? And when an AI makes a wrong conclusion, who will be held responsible? What can we do? Who will be, yes, what can we do? Yeah, that, that's very important. It's a very nice question. And that's what responsible AI is uh, dealing with uh, because, uh, someone has to this is human health that you are talking about so that's why uh we must develop the systems responsibly and like i said before there are no strong uh if there are any legislations now in places in different countries to take care of this uh I've always as a question if a self-driven car hits somebody who takes responsibility so these are issues. There are a lot of gray areas, truth must be told, at this, this stage of uh, the development of AI. There are issues that are yet to, uh, be, to, yet to be handled. And, and that's why responsible AI has, has come in. So in healthcare, there should be little or no room for, for, for errors. So that's what responsible AI is addressing. All right. Um, Dennis, sorry if I didn't pronounce your name very well. So he says that uh, the slide with the solution in India that uploads data from devices onto a server somewhere, in, somewhere is interesting. Do these medical devices commonly come with networking capabilities? So yes, if they are yes. Okay. If they are designed to be so, because uh, uh, if, if you design it to have a, a internet of thing or internet of medical thing uh, capability, it's a matter of sensors transmitting uh, to, from one device to the other. Uh, implementing sensors, IoT-based sensors, is a, a, a common thing today. 
uh, all you need to do is to identify the, the, the server in the cloud where you want the data to be uploaded to, and then put that address and the necessary uh, uh, the, uh, data base and things like that in your code. And then you should be able. So the, the case we saw in India is uh, it, one of the, the, the systems I reviewed, Sense, Sensely, uh, uses that approach to, to it comes with that it comes with equipment that enables you to check your weight and transmit it and other vitals transmit it straight to the to the cloud so it is built to work that way all right thank you very much uh, professor dano um, another question here is that is uh, from babatunde Fakunle, I think that these are two questions. I'm going to take two of them at once. He said, how can we use AI to overcome this type of network hiccups experience today? So he went for that to say that I'm interested in the health app that is able to carry out lab tests without blood. Uh, mm -hmm. Quite interesting. Can you provide more information on this issue, if possible, with respect to accuracy and productivity? Anyways, I noticed that the questions are coming and continues to come, it continues to come, and uh, we only have a few minutes to end this uh, program today. Um, we're going to share uh, Professor Danos' um, email, which I'm sure it has been shared, so that anyone, if you don't finish all the questions today, you could actually write him directly and get, uh, or write any of the organizers, myself and Professor Ali, or um, Francesco, or um, Professor Jude, to for any clarity, any clarity you may wish to have. But before I go to, okay, okay, you may answer that question then. Before I yeah, go to yeah, yeah, the question is interesting. You know, uh, the modem needs to be intelligent to know not, when not to go off. It shouldn't go off when it is connected. So, 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 uh, so the design of the modem is not intelligent enough. So, in future modem design, we should know that uh, once there's traffic going on, it shouldn't go off. Then um, the second one, the, the app you are talking about is online. And uh, um, I think which one is that you are, the, 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 I think the, each one of them, you can use the name to, to check it, like Bina, just Bina.com and so on and so forth. You can find it online and, uh, or every one of them is online, so you can use the name. Uh, we may, I think, we will share the slide also, so that through the slide you can get more information on some of those apps if you're interested. Like I said, I'm not marketing them. I don't know who they are. I'm only doing a review. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dano. Uh, I'd like to invite a few people that have raised their hand to to ask their questions. I have uh, Elia Bajo. Elia Bajo, please, if you are there, could you please, um, uh, please, could you please ask your question? The floor is yours right now. Elia Bajo, are you there? Okay, seems like, uh, uh, I just gave them permission to be able to talk. So uh, let's see if they might be here now. Okay. Eli, are you the one talking right now? No, okay. Okay. Eli Bajo, please, the floor is yours. Ask your question. Okay. Maybe Eli is not available at the moment. Could we move to Samuel Ifejikaf? Samuel, please, uh, your hand is up if you can ask your question. Okay, so basically, my question, I've already written it down. Let me just read it. So I was just saying, on responsible AI, uh, the speaker spoke on the speaker. Uh, I'm saying that on responsible AI, on responsible AI, I want the speaker to speak more on it. 
from his uh, from his presentation, I can see that the head, the head AI solutions he reviews gives some concepts of responsible AI like ethical practices and information security. They spoke on they spoke on they spoke on not storing uh, this, they spoke on not storing the information of users. So I just wanted to speak on more clarity because he was saying that uh, there was no there, there, there was there were no notes on responsible AI for those solutions. Okay, thank you very much, Samuel. Uh, well noted. Now, if you if you followed my presentation, you will see that uh, uh, issue on data protection is not the only issue on uh, responsible AI. There are other issues like bias, transparency, uh, and some of those I've mentioned. And then when you when I reviewed those things, uh, it was just about two of them that two or three they're about that. Uh, talked about, they only, they only talked about the area of data protection, which is an aspect I agree with you, but uh, it's thought deep enough. When you look at them, if you have time, you look at them, you discover it is not deep enough because I've reviewed them and I've discovered that what they put on there is not deep enough. So they're only talking about uh, uh, data protection, which I think they, they need to, to do more in the area of uh, responsible AI. So thank you for your observation. Okay, thank you very much for your, thank you, for, thank you very much for your question. And um, we wanna move uh, a little bit faster now. We want to take a question from Francis An Anoki. Francis asked, uh, most of African cultures or cultural cultures is exclusive of people of different gender. How easy or difficult does this affect the elimination of bias when it comes to our collection of data in solving some of our challenges using AI? Well, um, when you talk about gender and bias, um, you, you collect your data. Sometimes the data you collect, what the kind of data you collect from the female gender may vary from the detail you get from the male gender, all right? So the, the issue of bias here we're, we're talking about is avoiding discrimination uh, in, in a way that the, the system we, develop, we, we, we produce or develop does not promote discrimination of one gender against the other. I, once again, I'll refer to uh, the AI policy we are working on. Uh, uh, nobody should be discriminated on the basis of gender, such that uh, the AI system should not have an algorithm that craftily eliminates or, uh, or deprive people of their rights based on their gender. So it's an issue of policy, number one, and two, it's an issue of uh, policy enforcement. And by enforcement, I've, thought, I've said that the system so developed has to be tested to see that they comply to the responsible AI paradigms. So yeah, we'll test it against uh, bias, biases of all type. We test it against uh, the check to be sure it is uh, interpretable, to be sure it is transparent, uh, it is ethical and so on and so forth. So uh, I do not think that uh, being an being Africa or collecting data from Africa should cause bias. It all depends on the intention that the designer or the developer has in mind. But if we have strong regulations, strong AI regulations, it it, it will ensure that. No system can be used until it has passed quality assurance test. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, uh, Professor Gano. And uh, I'd like to take a question from Kazad Negriwala. It says, um, how intensive? So I'm gonna take two questions actually from two persons so that uh, we'll make it faster. 
So I'm taking from Kazat. Kazat says how intensive should be should be a testing of the AI algorithm. So I, I guess they wanted to know how intensive it's going to be to test AI algorithms and what parameters should one consider during the validation. That is one. The second question is going to come from Ujungwa Mbo, which says, don't you think it will be cool to start with incorporating AI into in most physician process like diagnos diagnosis or treatment, since most of them are traveling out and the few back home will be helped with this uh, with this for faster and more effective work. So I guess he's trying to find out, is it not better to start building this back at, back at home while people, since people are traveling out of the country so that they can help people back at home. So what's your take on that, So. Okay, okay. Um, the first question on the issue of algorithms. Um, there are um, already existing AI algorithms that have been tested and uh, there are, we know the kind of results they should produce and we can benchmark them that if they do not pro uh, produce this kind of result at certain level of accuracies and precision, then they are not qualified to be used or something is wrong there. So uh, except one is formulating a new algorithm. Yeah, if you are formulating a new algorithm, then uh, the community of practice must also test it. And that is why we have peer review. You present it in a, in a, in a, in a research con in a conference, um, in a learner society, publish it in papers, and then people can test your algorithm. And um, before it can be accepted, so against the issues of uh, uh, responsible AI, test it against uh, ethical practices and the rest of them that I've been talking about all the while. So if you are developing a new algorithm, then it must go through uh, acceptance, acceptance test by people who are in the field of AI. And um, like I said, AI is still is not very young neither is it old also a lot is happening at a very short time so i believe that a time is coming that we will have strong uh, bodies that we testing like we 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 have the i triple e that uh, create standards for programming uh, electronic based uh, practices and all that so there are some of those standards also in uh, when you look at the i triple e software development uh, approach, you see that there are standards for everything, for data collection, data gathering. And in AI, we have the, the standards are already there, how to reprocess -pre your data, how to test the quality of your results using uh, accuracy measures, the, the precision measure and all that. So I think that will take care of uh, the issue of algorithm. Um, so the question asked by uh, uh, Ujungwa, I think that uh, it's not just going to be a work for those at home. It's going to, if you, if you look at my conclusion, I said that a concerted effort must be put in place, both the, those in the, the medical practice, those in IT, those in data sciences, we must all put our heads together to solve this problem. This problem is real and uh, AI has come to stay and you can't stop people from moving. So these things are things that must happen and the people's health must be uh, cared for. So these are things that exist and must happen. And so uh, we have the problem has come upon us and then we must fashion ways to solve this problem. So both those in the diaspora and those at home must all work together to create the uh, AI solutions for our healthcare system and the funding is needed because some of them will require uh, some hardware, some sensors that uh, uh, people have to wear to transmit data in real time. Um, you, if, as I'm talking about uh, conversational AI, that requires research also because it's not just about, for instance, developing something that will speak Yoruba or understand Igbo. No, but you also look at the, the dialectical aspect of it also. So a lot of work is required. Even those in the linguistics will be involved. So I think it's something that all of us have to do. Thank you. All right.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, so, you. So, so, so intensive and uh, very interesting and engaging speech. Thank you, Professor, for your you know, thoughtful presentation. Because of time, I think um, I will not go ahead to uh, take more questions. I will crave your indulgence for your, those of you that have sent questions to possibly send it to uh, Professor Dano directly to his email, or you can forward it to us, we'll send it to him for you also receive a feedback from him through your email. So at this point, I would like to uh, call in our co-president and director, Professor Ali, for a closing remark. Before that, uh, please, if you want to be a volunteer to AI for PEP, you are encouraged to do so. And um, for some of you that are directors or you have uh, interest in making giving a talk like this, you can also contact us directly when it comes to talks like AI, AI for PEP or um, pandemic preparedness and responsible AI, especially in the African context. So at this point, I would like to hand over to Professor Ali for the closing remark. Professor Ali, you're mute. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for participating in this uh, great session. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, Udano for a great presentation and insights about uh, this very important topic. And thank you, Balasang, for moderating the session. Um, uh, we appreciate all your time uh, very much. And looking forward to see you in the next session uh, that is coming in two weeks. And uh, uh, with another interesting presentation uh, and discussion. Uh, and as mentioned by, uh, by Blessing, we would be happy to have the speakers from uh, the participants and also those that you may know. Please uh, be in touch with us. And thank you again um, for uh, your participation. With that, we conclude this session uh, and uh, say goodbye to all of you.